Hello, everyone. My name is Claude Renitsky, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to our third webinar as part of our MIT and True Africa University webinar series. As you might have seen when you registered, this whole entire series is about sustainable development in Africa. And we have different ways of defining the sustainable development. The way we're looking at it is really more from the perspective of the various industries, the various services that can really help Africa to leapfrog and, and, and really kind of fulfill its potential as, as potentially a, a, a next uh, and very important powerhouse in the global economy. And, and today we have a very, 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 very special speaker who I was just saying uh, just a few minutes ago is a bit of an overachiever. But before I get to him, I wanted to, um, to share my screen and, um, and actually kind of tell you what we're doing, why we're so, so excited about this series, which is lasting 11 weeks, this 11 week series. And uh, what I was saying about sustainable development in Africa is really about identifying specific industries and finding the people, the movements and the possibilities around growing industries in Africa. And so today our topic is what are the initiatives and investments transforming Africa. And our, our speaker is Inoluwa Aboyeji. And we'll talk about the name um, later, but um, some people call him Ian, some people call him E, but in any event, he is an entrepreneur in the public interest. Um, he made news. A lot of people have been talking about his, uh, his latest company uh, over the past week because he helped to co-found and lead Flutterwave, which is um, Africa's latest unicorn. Uh, the company raised another $170 million last week out of Nigeria and at a valuation of $1 billion. And then and, and, and there's been talk that they might go public uh, potentially on the New York Stock Exchange and become one of Africa's fastest growing and most successful startups. But prior to that, E, as I call him, he had co-founded Andela, which is Africa's largest engineering organization that has received investment from Mark Zuckerberg and Google Venture, amongst others. He now leads Future Africa, which is really what we're going to be talking about today, because you know, he's been spending his time as a successful serial entrepreneur and investor, helping other founders, as well as philanthropists and other investors from around the world, not just Silicon Valley, not just Nigeria, but really around the world, understand how to build fast growing and impactful technology business in Africa. So the word fast is important and the word impact is really important. So I'm, um, I'm Claude Granitsky, um, the founder of two media companies, uh, Trace and True Africa. And my entire career has been dedicated to championing the creativity and the innovation of young Africans. And when I say Africans, I define Africans very broadly. I say Africans from the African continent, but also Africans from the diaspora and also African Afro descendants. That could be African-Americans, that could be um, Afro-Brazilians, that could be Afro-Caribbeans. So that is what I've been doing. I'm a product of the MIT environment. I received an MBA as a Sloan Fellow. And the reason I launched a true Africa university is because I'm one of those people who wanna to help to find actionable ways to nurture Africa's talent. And, and I, I wanted to say, um, Ian is exactly in, on the same vibe. And this series would not have been possible without the support of our partners. And those partners are the MIT Center for International Studies. I'm actually a research affiliate at the MIT Center for International Studies. I've been a research affiliate there for about 10 years. And, and we aim to support and promote international research and education at MIT. Uh, we produce research that creatively addresses global issues while helping to educate the next generation of global citizens. The website is cis.mit.edu. Our other sponsor and partner is the MIT Africa program, which is uh, based at the MIT Center for International Studies. And the MIT Africa program empowers MIT students and faculty to advance knowledge and solve the world's great challenges by connecting them with leading researchers, companies, and other partners in African countries. The website is misti.misti.edu. Again, it's misti.misti.edu. 
And finally, uh, this introduction is gonna summarize what True Africa University is all about. So created by Africans for Africa, True Africa University, which hopefully one day will be known as TAU, just like the Massachusetts Institute of Technology is known as MIT. Um, TAU aims to become the Pan-African learning community that is committed to accelerating Africa's sustainable development by mobilizing a global network of academic, industrial, and institutional partners. Our website is trueafricauniversity.com and all the videos for the webinars as well as the supporting materials uh, that are presented during the webinars are available on trueafricauniversity.com. So now I get to stop sharing my screen if I can, and I get to uh, get off the stage and really turn it over to my friend, um, E. Aboyeji, who again is uh, one of the most successful entrepreneurs on the African continent. And he's built two very successful companies, actually now three, and he hasn't even turned 30 yet. So E, please, the, the floor is yours. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing your presentation before we get into our, our fireside chat. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much, Cloud, for being so generous. Um, I do want to apologize um, before I start to speak because um, <laughs> we had a small scheduling snafu because of the, the way uh, time is done in America. So I was hoping I would be seated in a lounge ready to talk to you in an hour and then all of a sudden realized that time moved forward one hour because of uh, the time zone shift over the weekend. So please, um, apologies. I've informed uh, my, my friendly driver here to uh, just keep me packed. So forgive the, the lack of a scenic background. Uh, I'll find a way to make up for it. Um, uh, I guess um, the best way to, to begin would be, uh, again, to thank MIT, and in particular, Claude, for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I'm deeply grateful to have an opportunity to share the little I know with uh, your community. Um, and I hope that, um, uh, you know, some of what I say today resonates well enough that a couple, a couple of you are looking into Africa um, as a focus for your work and for your endeavors going forward. Um, I imagine now is a good time to put up the slides I prepared. Is that possible? Absolutely, Michelle will put him up now. <laughs> amazing, amazing. So I was asked to talk about initiatives and investments that are transforming Africa. And I'm just gonna try um, to kind of uh, speak to things uh, more or less at, at, a, at a super, super high level. Um, you know, just thinking about things from a frameworks perspective. Um, and, and slightly less from a super specific perspective. Because I find that oftentimes in talking about initiatives and investments that are required to transform Africa, it's very easy to get caught in the weeds. Um, and the weeds are important because really that's how things get done over here. But at the same time, I think it's usually helpful to put things in a framework perspective so people understand you know, what the role in particular of technology investment is playing um, in transforming the continent. Um, I, um, please, next slide. <laughs> Hello, Michelle. Awesome. I'd like to show folks this slide because I think that it really does sum up the reason why, um, quite frankly, there should be a lot more uh, attention being paid to what's going on in Africa. Um, I mean, that's not to say the attention being paid right now is insufficient in any way, shape or form, but definitely we should be thinking, if we're thinking far enough into the future about more, more things, right? Um, I, I like to tell people, if you just look at the population demographics, you know, it's very easy to figure out that Africa is at the heart of our shared global future. Um, you can see that straight line for Africa and that line for Asia, which is, rapidly coming down in terms of population. And what you quickly recognize is that you've got um, a bunch of energetic 20 year olds in Africa who are hopeful for a better future for themselves, um, 
regardless of how bleak the present circumstance may seem. Um, and the real danger is that if you don't find a way to engage these 20 year olds who are over the next 15 years going to be the largest workforce um, in the world, um, you, you, um, you really end up in a, you really end up in a scenario where you, you, um, you're, you're, you're basically struggling um, to keep the world peaceful and productive. Um, because if you have a bunch of despairing young people um, across, across Africa, and everybody imagines they're gonna be able to move on to a better and more progressive world without them. Uh, well, I, I got a bridge to nowhere to sell you. It just simply will be impossible because that's just not how human beings work. Human beings will do whatever it takes to give themselves a better life, even if it means making life slightly worse for other people. And I think that's why the whole world has to kind of pay a lot more attention to what's happening in Africa, because it's never a good idea to have a ton of young people without a future and opportunities and most importantly, hope. Um, next slide. Well, it goes without saying that despite how amazing um, uh, you know, the African continent is um, and all the promise that, that it holds as a result of all the young people, you quickly realize also that Africa is home to some of the world's most difficult challenges, right? Um, you've got, for example, um, kids out of school, right? Highest proportion of kids out of school reside in Africa. Um, it's almost as many as, uh, as 300 million kids um, by, by, by 2035. Um, you have unemployment. Um, people need jobs, right? You have over 300 million people who need jobs uh, by 2035. Um, you've got a really bad uh, malnutrition problem. Uh, more than a third of all children under five in Africa are stunted because they simply don't have good food with good nutrients. And that means that their mental capacity um, is likely to be challenged for, for, for a long time. And, and you know, this is, um, this is very concerning because, you know, when people don't have mental capacity, um, um, you know, then they become extremely violent. And, and when they become extremely violent, there are real consequences and, and behaviors that follow that. And, and I say this to just simply say that, you know, these are real challenges that come from Africa. I'm not here really to sell you an Africa rising story. There are real challenges in Africa. But again, um, as, as you see on my next slide, uh, Michelle, you can go on to the next slide. Um, the, the big challenge really with these problems is normally we would be able to, you know, throw a bit of dollars at it. We'll be able to raise hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe, or billions of dollars to, to, to tackle these problems. That's how you know, other continents got a shot at doing it. You know, you had, uh, in Europe, you had the Marshall, the Marshall Plan. In America, you had the reconstruction. I mean, most, most governments, government typically is expected to step into it and solve it. But I think what's different now is that governments can step in because they don't, they don't have the money, especially post-corona, to actually do this. Everyone, everyone all over the world is struggling with providing the basics for their people. They're unlikely to um, prioritize Africa over their own local populations. And most African governments are just cash trapped, right? Um, you know, this is a very fanciful graph that kind of illustrates, um, gives some level of quantum to the challenge um, when it comes to finances. Um, so you have, you know, um, the state of New York's um, uh, um, and budget versus you know, the annual infrastructure requirement. Um, and you can see New York can meet theirs adequately. Um, but you know, Nigeria, Nigeria's cap infrastructure budget is just $9 billion. Kenya's infrastructure budget is just $5 billion. Um, and, and the state of New York, which is perhaps like a 10th in size, um, you know, at least from a size of government perspective, just the state in the, in the much larger um, 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 behemoth of the United States is, you know, um, um, able to, 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 
to get over three times the infrastructure funding. So the, the whole idea of spending your way out of these challenges just doesn't work uh, because the solutions really can't scale fast enough. And I think what makes these challenges particularly tricky is their wicked problems. So wicked problems are problems that kind of get more complex um, as time goes on. So think about it, you know, how are you gonna put 300 million kids into jobs if in Nigeria alone, over 10 million of them can't even go to school? What kind of jobs would you have in 2035 that wouldn't at the very least require um, a sound understanding um, of, of literacy, uh, uh, sound understanding of math. I, I think it's almost impossible. So they can't get the kind of jobs we're creating in Mandela without an. Uh, uh, they don't have a. Uh, can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. You went in and out, but you're Hello, back now. You you're back now. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Sorry. Um, so yeah. So they don't. They don't have um, an education to be able to get any kind of decent job, and this. This is unfortunately the challenge. Um, you know, without uh, the education to get a decent job, um, the spiral continues. And that's, that's the definition of a wicked problem. Um, and then even when you think about an early childhood education, right? If you're malnourished between the ages of one to five, when you should be developing your brain, um, and, um, and, and, and so you get into um, standard one um, at five years old, and you, you, you have a malnourished brain, it's gonna be really, really hard for you to learn, right? So these are examples of some of the challenges, you know, they get far more complex, far more dangerous as time goes on. And, and that's where, you know, and, and the governments don't have the money to fix all these problems. Um, next slide. So I think, my, my own theory really, uh, and it's called from uh, the last book that somebody who many people in this room will know very well um, wrote before, before he died, um, you know, the, the great um, um, Christensen, uh, who is the father of disruption theory. You know, he wrote, he wrote an excellent book with a friend of mine called Efoso Joma. Um, and, and the book basically talked about these market creating innovations, right? And the big idea with market creating innovations was that, you know, things that basically look pretty innocent, you know, things that look like toys um, could basically scale to become, you know, these effective solutions to huge societal, society wide wicked problems. Um, and, and it differentiates between, you know, uh, sustaining innovation, efficiency innovation, and market creating innovation. You know, sustaining innovation is what government tends to do with these large grants, um, like they gave with, you know, the when when you know when when we were rebuilding Europe and all that, wire up the city and make sure there was infrastructure. Um, you know, and 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 that was a lot of what was happening, right? Um, that, that kind of sustaining innovation. Um, it, it, it just comes in from somewhere else to improve performance at incredible costs. Um, then you have efficiency innovation, right? Which is really about doing more with less, right? So, you know, private equity is right, right up this alley, you know, where, you know, they're gonna cut jobs and they're gonna use a lot more technology and so on and so forth. Target existing customers with lower prices and all of that. Uh, but you see, market creating innovations is, is a completely different kettle of fish, because what you have with market creating innovation is that they are, you know, they're very simple. They start out very simple and affordable. It's not about uh, you don't need a hundred billion dollars to start, as you see with some of the companies whose examples I use as in the course of this course. Um, and um, they target, uh, they, they kind of serve the underserved or the unserved. So they target new customers, not old customers, but new customers. Um, they tend to create tons of jobs, right? Because they're just brand new stuff. Um, and typically they require some level of kind of labor effect to work. You know, if you think about something like an Uber um, and the kind of impact that it's had on the society uh, in terms of creating gig work for lots of young people, um, 
that doesn't have a high barrier to learning, that's creating tons of jobs. So if you didn't have an Uber, you wouldn't be able to create those jobs. And, and most importantly, they enable development. So our belief, um, and my belief in particular, is that you know, Africa just needs to be thinking more about market creating innovations. I think for me, um, I, I normally ask uh, new, new um, analysts that come to work with us these questions, like what's the most successful venture capital investment of all time? And, and um, people have a lot of very interesting answers. Uh, but the the one the one um, I, I appreciate the most, and my own answer to that question, is a mobile phone. The mobile phone is by far the most successful venture capital investment of all time, because not just did it uh, return um, um, you know uh, uh, return capital, and and uh, folks like Mo Ibrahim can tell you all of that stuff, but but I think that um, uh, more importantly, it's um, it's, um, it's actually spawned an industry. If you look at, at every single um, um, institution, um, you know, that has come out of, uh, of this telephony revolution in Africa, it's just absolutely astonishing. In almost every country in Africa, the number one or number two company is a mobile telephony company. Um, and, and even more, more interestingly, uh, you know, if you if you really take a deep look at what's really going on, you know, you see all these multi-billion-dollar industries that were built on the back of the mobile phone. Um, you know, whether it's ring back tunes, whether it's mobile money, and, and and that's the power of market grade innovation. What people used to do before the mobile phone um, was a reality in Africa was, you know. Um, people imagined that just like in the UK or in the US, um, we would have fixed phone lines. And there were a few fixed phone lines. I remember having a fixed phone line in my house when I was growing up and we would have long lines of people queue um, to come to our home so they could speak to their family abroad um, with fixed phone lines. But now you know, everybody, um, every single person, over 900 million phones across the continent. So that's the power of a market creating innovation. Ne next slide. So what I try to do is, you know, with the, with the Fund for Africa's Future, because that's, that's kind of what, what we work as, um, we try to work with the best companies that, that can deliver these innovative solutions and, and really unlock these new markets. That's kind of our, our own secret sauce. It's really, how do you work with companies that are so revolutionary? They not only make a ton of money, but they make you make a ton of impact. Right? because they just create this brand new categories that no one ever saw coming in Africa. Um, next slide. And, you know, what we try to do um, um, as we do that is, you know, we find these companies, um, we provide them with capital at the very earliest stages, provide them with coaching, provide them with community, um, and, and, you know, work very closely with these mission-driven innovators who just want to change the world to, to build these companies that turn Africa's biggest challenges into global business opportunities. And by so doing, create economic opportunity and develop. Um, and we work together with so many uh, amazing people uh, from founders, to governments, to investors, to large companies that want to change the game. Uh, these are these are the the people we work with uh, to make to make these opportunities possible. Next slide. So every time we start a company, we we, we start a company. We like to say we start companies to answer questions. Um, you know, we don't just start a company. We we have a question we want to answer, and we think the right answer is to build a company um, that answers the question and. I remember when we started in Florida with the question in our mind was, you know, Africa has suffered because it's, it's a very insular economy, right? It's not very connected to the global economy. I think Africa is about 4% of global trade, um, which, is, which is pretty interesting. Um, so I, I, I um, you know, when, when, when we're starting in Florida, we, we started to ask the question, you know, how do you connect Africans to the global economy? Uh, and the first step was, you know, well, how do you get all the different, you know, 200 payment methods that African business people and merchants have to use to send and receive money 
how do you make that one platform? Um, and then how do you make it easy for them to accept and disperse money however they choose, right? To move money across mediums. And that's what we've been able to achieve with Flutterwave. And, uh, and the journey is just beginning, even with the unicorn valuations, just the valuation. But really the mission remains uh, to connect all Africans to the global economy by enabling them to be able to leverage payments to participate, digital payments to participate in the global economy. Um, the market woman who sells corn doesn't have to wait um, for you know, um, somebody to drive by her farm and buy her corn at a naturally low price when she can sell her corn on one day on global commodity exchanges and get paid um, via Flutterwave. And, and that's the kind of global economy we want to create, one that's fairer and that provides more access. Um, next, next, next slide. Forgive me. Next slide. So again, another, another big question we're answering. How do you create 400, 400 sorry, uh, can we go one slide behind? Hello. Hello, can we go back to the Andela slide? Yeah, I think the Andela slide is, it was on just now. Yeah, I think there might be a delay okay. on your end. Fantastic, thank you so much. So the question we asked when we're building, when we're building Andela um, was, you know, how do you create 450 million jobs for young Africans, right? Because you have, you know, over the next 15, 20 years, you've got about 450 million young people who you need to create jobs for, right? And you don't have enough of those jobs. And for the longest time, you know, jobs in Africa were tied in many ways to the local geography. And no matter how fast you can grow as an economy, you know, there's just so many jobs you can create growing 8% a year and being a sub trillion dollar economy. It's just physics, you know, it doesn't work. And what we were able to do with Andela was really kind of fashion out a path to just in time education to employment skills training, where essentially you're able to identify job openings all over the world. Um, you're able to find talented young people who are motivated to fill those jobs if they could get the right training. And then you basically bankroll the training and, uh, and when the young people get into the jobs, you take uh, a rake um, from their earnings, um, which then allows you to continue to deeply invest in the next generation uh, of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of talent and, and then continue to scale. So, so that was the question we tried to answer at Andela is you, how, how do you market create? Now, we didn't exactly reach uh, those, those heights uh, particularly um, and we're still on that journey. But I think what's really ex exciting about Andela was that it, it created a market for African technology talent, created a global market for African technology talent. For the first time in the world, you could go on the internet and say, you know, I work um, in Africa um, and people will take you seriously um, and hire you to do jobs. I mean, you know, in the last report I was reading from Google, I think they said there were about 77,000 senior developers um, working remotely from Nigeria alone. And I think about 150 across, 150,000 across the continent. That's just an example of the kind of impact that a company like Adela has had, you know, creating amazing middle-class jobs remotely um, from, from all over the world. Next slide. Hello, next slide. Yeah, healthcare, you know, how do you, how do you create affordable healthcare for people who are earning, you know, $2 a day, right? A lot of healthcare is predicated on, you know, some cost of tons of, huge facilities and buildings and, and so on and so forth. And these young folks at MDAS, which is ironically uh, an MIT, um, I, the founders are MIT grads. You know, what they've done is basically make diagnostics the fulcrum of healthcare delivery, which is amazing, right? Um, you know, when you, when you have the diagnostics, you know what, what people, what's ailing people, it makes it a lot 
easier for you to direct them to the right doctor who can remotely actually, um, they have to go and buy it in order to treat their ailment. And this rapidly, um, particularly when you're using these uh, diagnostic devices that are fairly cheap um, and, and are used. So this is just uh, an example. Um, next slide. Sorry, I'm starting to get messages. Uh, next slide. <laughs> STEM Cafe, I promise this is the last one. Um, so, so with STEM Cafe, um, you know, what, what, what we realized was, you know, um, science, technology, engineering, and math uh, in Africa is, is severely challenged. And the reason for that is, you know, our, our schools don't really have um, the technology facilities. And the way that our teachers tend to teach is not play-based. You know, it's very much, you know, take this textbook and cram it <laughs> into your head. Those of you who went to school in Africa can relate. Um, and basically, you know, we started this play-based spaces, network of play-based spaces um, for, for young innovators, um, enabling them to make things with their hands and to use modern tools um, to unlock in their, in their minds the power of science and technology. And so it's, you know, chemistry is not just a boring textbook to them. It's, you know, a bunch of experiments they can do with household uh, um, goods uh, uh, or, or, you know, uh, a lab experiment they can do from the comfort of their home um, or something they can be curious about, um, just like this young lady is. And I have no doubt that, that spaces like STEM Cafe, as they proliferate across Africa, are going to inspire uh, the next generation of scientists and engineers to come from Africa because, you know, it's in getting our young people uh, comfortable with the physics and the science of the world that we live in, that we're able to actually build new technology that increase productivity and, and further accelerate our economic growth. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so, you know, what we've developed because of, because of our time and, and the way we think about the world is really a framework for building the future in Africa. And, and I'll just share with you kind of the highlights of that model. I think you know, there are three things a company must do, right? Um, number one, they have to prove uh, that they have a big market that they're trying to pursue. You know, without a big market, it's kind of, kind of silly. I see lots of people kind of make really uh, nice apps for the 1% of the 1% of Africa. Um, you know, people who want to book private jets via an app and stuff like that, but it's a very small, uh, a market in Africa, and you really want to back founders that are building transformational businesses. Um, and you talk about mission, right? So mission is extremely important. You got to have founders who, whose most important priority is not even being rich; it's just making change happen. Right? And they're actually happy if somebody else figures it out before they do. Um, and they're happy to collaborate with their colleagues because it's about the industry and about the impact they can have on people's lives. Not really about just making money. And then most importantly, you got to take a close look at the business model. You know, um, this is a society where the vast majority of people live in extreme poverty under a dollar a day. Um, so, you know, for the most part, if you're trying to build a mass market product, you got to be very careful to design the product in such a way that people can make money from using the product rather than the product costing them. more. And that's something that a lot of people still have to learn. Um, when you think about, yeah, okay, I, okay, I was almost done. When you think about what, what somebody must have, you know, you have to think about talent, you gotta think about data, um, you gotta think about design and, and most importantly, distribution. And when I say, you know, I've talked about some of those things, you think about talent, you're asking, is this a mission driven founder? You think about data, you're thinking, is this market big enough? Think about design, thinking how is this product optimized? Uh, to ensure the least possible friction using it. And when you think about distribution, you know, what allies do I need to have to get this business to scale? Um, and then most importantly, you know, we try to support these companies building the future in Africa with capital, um, with coaching um, and with, with a huge community, you know, um, that, that can support them uh, in reaching their business goals. Um, yeah, so I, I'm going to stop there and, and then uh, I, I'm sure 
we'll get to the rest of it either during the fireside chat or, or much later. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you so much, E, for sharing um, these, I'll just call them words of wisdom, even though you're a young man still in your 20s for a few more days. Um, it's, it's really great to, to, to be having this dialogue with you. And I, I want to actually go back to, uh, you know, we met almost like 10 years ago, and I want to go back to an interview that I did um, right after you raised uh, quite a lot of money from Mark Zuckerberg and a bunch of people for Andela. And, and, and one interview that I did for the True Africa website, you, you said something to me that, um, that we printed on the True Africa website in the interview. And you said, from a very early age, I knew that my whole life would be about helping to build the future of the African continent. So uh, I want to get deeper into that. But tell me, when you say from a very early age, how did that, how did that start? Because you are uh, an exceptional entrepreneur having built two and now almost three very successful companies while still in your 20s. So how did it all start for you? I want to get to the genesis. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I, I got into this whole building the future thing somewhat by accident, to be very honest. Um, I mean, I definitely knew that I wanted my continent to be different. I, I would say I had my first experience with um, um, Africa because, you know, you get to live a very sheltered childhood when you live in Nigeria at the time that I did. And I had my very first experience with the reality of the kind of country I lived in when, when I was 15. Um, myself and a bunch of my friends were supposed to be flying home. And um, I missed the flight, uh, but my friends weren't so lucky. They didn't miss the flight and they died in a plane crash, so so uh, plane crash DC-10, uh, December 5th, 2005. Uh, December 10th, 2005, forgive me. And, um, and I think, and no one was called to account on that. And I think that radically changed the way I thought about the world because all of a sudden, you know, I, I, it suddenly occurred to me that no amount of privilege um, was going to, uh, was going to protect me from the harsh realities of the society that I was living in. And I figured, you know, what I was going to have to do with the privilege that I had was to, was to fix all of that. Um, and, and I thought I would do that by going to work at the United Nations. And then I thought I was going to do that by becoming a journalist. And, and then I thought I was going to do that by, um, you know, becoming a lawyer. Uh, but the good thing was, you know, I kind of ran into tech. I had a really good friend. His name's Pierre Iris, Polish kid. Um, and he basically, um, you know, he introduced me to the world of technology and I never, never found my way back out. Um, and, and quite frankly, that was the genesis. I, when I realized that there was a possibility um, of changing the world by just building products that other people use. Um, and by doing so, you know, you could change the way they think. You could, you could, um, you could inspire them. Um, and most importantly, you could solve very big problems for them. Um, I mean, that, that power to be able to change things without anybody's permission kind of built um, uh, in comparison to all the other paths to to building the future of Africa that I had seen. And, and so I just stuck to it. I don't know if that answers your question, Kwa. It does, it does. And, and, and I wanna go maybe fast forward a little bit. And I wanna talk about, again, in that same interview, um, you, know, you were saying, and this was just a few months after you, you know, raised this money for Endel and launched this company, which instantly became the most talked about startup in the whole of the African continent. And, and then you said, you know, I think if you do something and it turns out pretty good, then you should go do something else wonderful, not dwell on it for too long. And then, and then shortly after that, you left Andela and then you started Flutterwave, which became an even more successful company. And so um, when we talk about serial entrepreneurs, usually st people stick to companies for, for five, 10 years and then they move on. But you were thinking in your twenties that every couple of years you move on to another challenge. Uh, you want to maybe share a little bit of insight behind that thinking? Yeah, I mean, um, I think for me, really, the the I've I've always had a long road map for for the continent. You know, um, uh, you know, I, I I I there's so much work to do that I don't think that if you're um, if you're capable and you're as determined as some of us can be, 
um, you, you have the luxury of like settling on one idea um, for a very long time. It's kind of like you're always on the road. You're always trying to build stuff. And, um, and I think for me, you know, when Andela was established and was, as I like to call it, when the companies are inevitable, um, then, you, then you start to look around and figure out, okay, what's the next big challenge to solve? And, and for me, you know, with Andela, it was fairly accidental, you know, like I, I, I had, um, you know, I kind of locked out because I had a long string of failures before Andela. And then uh, I kind of locked out on Andela and there was a lot of pressure to kind of, you know, you know, not catch a break, you know, like just kind of stick to what was working. Um, but, but I quickly realized that there was, there was a lot of danger in that as well, you know. Um, the, the, the danger uh, in that approach um, is that other things don't get built and, um, and you're very comfortable. And, you know, when you're young, that's the best time to take risks and build things. So, you know, I started to look at that and, and, and I figured, you know, the right approach to, to dealing with uh, uh, some of the challenges was just, you know, go build something else, go show people that other things need to be built in this space. And that was, um, and that was what led me to, to Flutterwave. But then, you know, at Flutterwave, I then started to build a roadmap, you know, and for me, it was very simple. It was, you know, we built the Stanford, then we need to build the PayPal, and now, now I like to say we're building the, the Founders Fund um, of Africa. Um, and then, you know, who knows what after that, you know, maybe I do, maybe I don't, we'll see. But, uh, but, but, I, but, but I, I mean, the way I think about the world is really that, you know, Africa, we have a long roadmap of things to build. Um, we can't just dwell on one feature. We got to kind of keep it moving as soon as something we've built becomes uh, um, inevitable. But then I, I really want to go back to what you said about a sheltered life and the life of privilege and, and those who have access to education. You know, I met you in New York. We spent time together in Boston. Uh, we spent time together in, in San Francisco on the campus of Stanford University, many other places. But the reality is, you know, a lot of these companies that you've built, the funding has come from the U.S. And you're also one of those Africans like myself who are able to navigate all these multiple worlds and to be able to go to the U.S. And, and convince the Mark Zuckerberg to invest in your company and be at Stanford and, and you know, all of those things. Uh, my question is really, those of our younger brothers and sisters who did not have that access to uh, the world of uh, elite academic institutions or Silicon Valley or MIT, uh, you know, what, what advice would you give them? Uh, I mean, for me, I think it, it, no matter what, but it still begins with being able to take out the mental barriers, right? I find that, you know, if you know, it's kind of like if you, if you, uh, if you put a, a, um, a, a dog in, uh, in chains or in a cage or you put a, a cage, uh, you put a bird in a cage, even when you let the cage out, if the, if, 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 if the bird doesn't have a, a mentality of freedom, you know, they're going to just stay in the cage. And I, I like to say the first thing is, look, the world is becoming more and more the sort of place where you have a place um, and you, you shouldn't um, let your, your mental barriers keep you from pursuing all the opportunities that are around you and before you. And, you know, people like me have a responsibility, particularly because of the privilege that we, um, that we had, uh, we enjoyed growing up um, uh, to, to make sure that people like you have, have opportunities. Um, and, and that's what we work for every day. Um, and so, you know, let go of the mental barriers and, and don't, don't outsource your outcomes to anybody. Don't make it anybody's fault um, that, that, that uh, you're not able to be successful. Uh, make that your responsibility instead. That, that would be my advice. Yeah, I, I, wanna, I wanna go back to what you said earlier in your presentation, because I was so happy that you mentioned Clayton Christensen, uh, may he rest in peace. And I was so happy that um, you mentioned his uh, co-author and, and, and really mentee, I would even call him a disciple, Ifosa Ojomo, who we love. So Ifosa yeah. is a Nigerian author, he's a researcher, he's a thinker, speaker. And I actually interviewed him uh, for the MIT Africa Innovate Conference two years ago. And he, the book had just come out, uh, the, the book that you mentioned. And for those in the audience um, who don't know about it, it's called The Prosperity Paradox how innovation can lift nations out of poverty. And so he was talking, as you mentioned earlier, about market creating innovations. And they, these are innovations that target 
new customers, as you said, the underserved. Um, Mo Ibrahim is the example they give at the beginning in, in chapter one in, in, in the chapter about market creating innovations. And they talk about how, you know, in the late 1990s, Mo Ibrahim saw this opportunity with, with cell phones and that, you know, that the people never thought they would need cell phones. And all of a sudden he saw, he created this company out of Sudan, Celtel, that became very, very, very popular. But then uh, what we don't talk about is a lot of those companies that actually end up failing. So um, can you, as in your short but successful life as an entrepreneur, what would be for you some of the reasons why companies have failed uh, you know, outside of just choosing a, a, a really narrow market, as you said earlier, what are some of the, and the mental barriers that, you know, Africans sometimes impose on themselves just because of the way we're treated and, and, and lack of self-confidence and lack of resources and lack of infrastructure, what would you say would be the main reasons why people have failed? Um, I, I think there are multiple different reasons people fail, but, but I, 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 would, I, I like to qualify, um, failure, quote unquote, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. because I feel like if you learned something, you didn't really fail. It was just an experiment. Um, but, but I think sometimes, you know, when, when the experiments don't, don't go very well, um, that typically happens because uh, people tend to um, um, not, not be willing to um, kind of build iteratively and organically as they go along, right? And build with in a series of experiments that test the existence of a market that they can serve. Um, I feel like a lot of people kind of, you know, in Africa particularly, our mentality tends to be to go big and go home. Um, and that tends to be very expensive and very difficult for you to iterate, you know? It's like, you know, if you try to build, you know, the ark, um, <laughs> you know, it's very different from building the boats. Um, and if you build the ark, you know, you better make sure that you have those uh, male and female of all the species in the ark with you otherwise you end up with a big expensive you know and difficult to get rid of project but if you build a boat you know and you need to perhaps build out more space that that tends to be a, a, a bit more easier uh, i don't know if folks we'll connect with the analogy i'm given but basically my point is you know we got to learn as africans to kind of build more iteratively you know build very lean as opposed to kind of uh, go fat uh, very quickly. And I think if we do that uh, many times, we would be able to test, confirm the existence of a market uh, before we actually go all in. Wonderful. So I wanna to get to the questions. Now. There's a lot of questions. We can only get to a few of them, uh, but this one is from Bolu Watife Akinola. And she says, oh, I'm actually uh, one of those people who went to the same school, um, the same secondary school as Ian, and my question is centered around how do we create a system to provide resources, financial as well as otherwise, to fund innovators on the continent who are tackling challenging problems like this? I personally don't believe the governments are the reliable answer, but how can private players and external agencies engage with that innovative community? Absolutely, I mean, and uh, you're absolutely right that governments can't be the answer. Um, like I said, they don't even have uh, enough resources to do kind of their primary responsibility. So funding innovation, which can be risky and, and, and uncertain um, is, is a bit of a, a, a reach. Um, and, and so that's why we set up the Fund for Africa's Future. And I'm, I'm super excited about all the different um, types of investment communities that are emerging. Um, you know, with the Fund for Africa's Future, what we've designed is really an invest, investment community where essentially, you know, people pay a membership fee of $1,000 a year. Um, and then in exchange for that, they get very detailed memos um, and data rooms for 20 companies a year that are African companies that are turning some of our biggest challenges into global business opportunities um, and are being led by amazing innovators. And then you get an opportunity to invest from $5,000 up uh, into, into uh, these companies uh, by leveraging uh, some of the infrastructure that we've been able to build around the world, depending on where you are, um, licensed infrastructure um, across, across, uh, across the world. And, and just doing this has enabled us to raise over $2 million between last year and this year for 
um, for African uh, companies. And we're just in the first quarter of, uh, of 2020. We've raised $2 million already um, and, and we're looking to raise even more. So I think these are examples of how you know, private, private individuals, um, not to even talk about government, not, um, uh, private agencies, or talk about kind of corporates uh, can participate in giving innovators uh, the capital, coaching, and community that they need uh, to be able to turn our biggest challenges into global business opportunities. Wow. So Romy Sumaria is asking a question, and her question is, what is your most successful failure? It's a very interesting question. My most successful failure. Yes. Um, that's that's a very that's a very interesting question. I would say um, my most successful failure was probably trying to run a presidential campaign. Um, so after I left Florida Wave, I tried my hand at politics um, and I, I ran uh, um, a presidential campaign for a mentor and friend of mine, um, Madam Obi is a She used to be a vice president uh, at, at the World Bank. And, um, and it taught me a lot because, you know, I got to actually for the first time really think about policy at a national level. We put out, um, Project Rescue Nigeria, which is by far one of the most detailed policy documents um, that Nigeria has ever seen. And um, uh, it actually is funnily enough uh, being implemented, even though we, we didn't even come close to running in the election, <laughs> actual election, mm -hmm. talk less of winning. So, you know, I saw the other day that the government had put in place a $2.5 trillion, uh, a $25 billion infrastructure fund. And that was one of our core recommendations about the need for us to kind of bring private sector in to come and help us build infrastructure um, and concession a lot of assets. And you know, to see all those ideas be implemented, even though you're not the one implementing them, is, is a bit of a success. And I'm glad we were able to popularize some of those ideas with that campaign, even though we didn't uh, even come close to winning. Well, so um, I, you know, we always wrap up with uh, the three books that you might recommend for our audience, because we're all about learning, right? And, and, and improving and, and being oh, better no. what we do. <laughs> but one of them is the prosperity paradox, right? So uh, I'm gonna put of that course, in the course. So we need you to recommend two more books that, uh, that could be helpful to our okay. audience to understand um, Africa and innovation and transformation. Okay. Um... I mean, the, one of the books I recommend is not about Africa, That's but, okay. but, it, but it's helpful frame for understanding um, innovation and transformation. And the book is Zero to One by Peter Thiel. Um, I mm -hmm. think it's definitely one of uh, the biggest, uh, one of the most important books I've read about, you know, how to think about the world of technology and what is possible, um, especially uh, uh, for Africans um, in, in the world of technology. Um, the other book I would recommend, uh, you know, is, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty, uh, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I don't want to also recommend a book that's extremely Nigerian. Yeah. You can, why not? Why not? <laughs> uh, well, you know, there, there probably, there probably isn't uh, very much of a need to, but, you know, I, I would say one thing I would say is, you know, I, I would say, Getting into the founder mindset is important for anybody who's looking to get into technology. And now one of the things that I've gotten a lot of inspiration from, um, you know, in my own journey as an entrepreneur is really being present to see other people who've done, done it uh, or to read about other people who've done it. I, I actually think anybody who wants to be an entrepreneur should probably spend, you know, um, you know, a whole year before they make that jump reading stories of other entrepreneurs who've, re who've made that jump and that they didn't actually, you know, die. Because that, you know, it's kind of like reading the word of God. It, it gives you a lot of faith, <laughs> yes. you know, because you suddenly realize that um, people, you know, like things are possible, you know. Um, so one of those books I really like, uh, Founders at Work by Jessica Simpson, I believe. Or, no, Jessica Livingston, I think okay. is, is the name of the book. It's a really, really cool book because it talks about the founding stories of companies that we all know and love from Blackberry to, you know, um, Lotus um, to, to, you know, um, um, Bill Gates and so on and so forth. So yeah, that's the book. Sorry, it doesn't, I don't have many 
Africa specific texts to share. <laughs> yeah, well, your own story I mean, is a book in itself. So we can we can end there because you're, we have your story and those three books, The Prosperity Paradox, Zero to One and Founders at Work. And all those books, along with the, the full presentation that you gave us today, will be available on the True Africa University website. So with that, awesome. I want to I want to thank you for for this session, which was enlightening as, as usual. I do want to say that um, your presentation dovetails really nicely with the one that we will be uh, having next Thursday at the same time. Hopefully, the time difference won't confuse too many people, and and and, and then they'll come on at twelve Eastern uh, Eastern Standard Time, Eastern Time, Boston Time, Cambridge Time, and and that presentation, Michelle, if you could share it with us, because I'm very excited to have a different perspective on transformation in Africa, and it's really. Um, Again, in a, in a related topic, what types of new partnerships can lead to African development? Uh, we will be welcoming uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, who is one of the most famous economists in the world. He is the founder of the Earth Institute at Columbia University, and um, he is uh, one of those people who wrote the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals for the United Nations. So he's going to be talking about uh, transnational, transborder partnerships, exactly like the ones that uh, allowed our friend and, 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 and actually um, uh, acolyte of E to become this very, very successful entrepreneur while still in his 20s. And so with that, I wanna also once again, thank our partners and sponsors uh, who um, again have made this series possible. It is um, um, the MIT Center for International Studies, which aims to support and promote international research and education at MIT, and the MIT Africa program, which empowers MIT students and faculty to advance knowledge and solve the world's greatest challenges. So again, I'm Claude Grinitsky. I'm the founder of True Africa University, which we have created by Africans for Africa in order to accelerate Africa's development through sustainable solutions. So thank you very much for your time. And we look forward to seeing you next Thursday at 12 p.m. Eastern Time, Cambridge Time. We'll see you there. Thank you. Thank you.